We were in the countryside and this was the beginning of an operation in Kaya, Kareni state. The junta, the military junta, saw uh, the Kareni resistance advancing towards their outpost uh, and basically they had time to actually position their mortars, even if they were small, very deadly, and start aiming uh, and shooting mortars towards where the resistance was advancing, towards where I was and, you know, together with, with younger soldiers at that moment. Siegfried Modela is a photojournalist and documentary photographer. He's been reporting on the bloody civil war in Myanmar for The Globe. At a certain point, uh, everyone was trying to you know, run for cover and they were trying, you know, they were, all the soldiers around me were trying to figure out from which direction that this mortar shelling was coming. What he's describing is a battle between the military regime and the resistance forces he was with. And uh, a group of us, uh, so there must have been, you know, 12, 15 other soldiers where I was, uh, we found this roadside uh, drainage ditch. We hid inside and it offered enough protection from these incoming mortars that were exploding close by. One of them, you can see in the picture, landed you know, very close, must have been less than, I would say, 50, 60 meters away from us. One, in the moment that picture was taken, just a few minutes afterwards, landed even closer and wounded one of the young soldiers. You can see the dust, the fumes rising uh, from the ground just moments after the explosion. And you can see the expression of this young Kareni soldier, this expression of, you know, fear, uh, amazement, and, you know, him saying, well, you know, we are still okay. Myanmar's civil war has been going on now for nearly three years, since the military staged a coup after a democratic election in 2021. Thousands of people have died, and at least two million people have been displaced. For a long time, the war was at a stalemate. But now, the resistance forces have been making gains against the military regime. And Siegfried has been there to document some of those battles. Today, Siegfried tells us about his journey to the new front lines of the civil war and the toll this conflict is taking on the population of the country. I'm Cheryl Sutherland, and this is The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. Siegfried, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me on the show. So Siegfried, you've done several trips to Myanmar in the past couple of years during this ongoing civil war. And you're one of the only foreign journalists who has been inside the country. And it's very difficult for you to get there. I, I just... I want to know, like, why do you keep going back? What What's your goal? You know, we can start with actually acknowledging that the situation in Myanmar is a very underreported story. Mm -hmm. International media is banned from covering the conflict in the country. The country has been in a state of war, we can say civil war, for the last three years mm -hmm. since the coup in 2021, mm -hmm. where the military junta overthrew the partially uh, democratic elected government. I was offered the chance to, to work on this story after the coup, mm -hmm. uh, which I took. And two years ago, I went for the first time in January 2022. And I've been covering the conflict in Kaya, in Kareni state, for the last two years. I've been traveling to the area for four times, and I've been embedded with units of Kareni soldiers for a total of, actually, we can say more than five months now. So you're with the Kareni forces, which is a militia group fighting the military regime. Can you help us understand, how did you get in with this group? Uh, through it took months of preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to convince uh, people at the top command uh, of the Kareni army that I was uh, fit enough to actually go physically inside the country. It takes days of walking to arrive where you have to arrive to cover the situation. How did and you convince them that you were fit enough? Uh, basically, I had to travel to the border region and uh, they had to meet me. Okay. Um, and then one thing led to the other. 
I was lucky enough to meet uh, some very influential people in the Kareni resistance. I've uh, been embedded with, you know, the top commanders. They saw that every time I was going back, you know, my work was luckily being published, which okay. it's, you know, this also, it's a big thing. It's, it's important to show this. Uh, but you said, you know, I'm here for a reason. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that I will shed light on what is happening. And this is the reason why they allow me to cover the story. Uh, and basically, I was embedded with the forces. And then every trip, I was embedded deeper inside the conflict and I understood the dynamics better. It's always this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's interesting. So for, for you to be in with them, embedded with them, it, it helps them as well, because it gets their message out um, to the to a wider public. Of course, you know, I think this is the, you know, this is, as you know, as I mentioned, it's a very underreported story. So mm -hmm. I believe that the people that, that are involved in the conflict and the civilians, the the parallel NUG government, uh, the ethnic armed groups, that are witnessing the conflict, are fighting the conflict and are bearing witness to the cost that the conflict has on the human population, on the civilian population, want, you know, need uh, journalists to show the world what is happening in the country. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, your images like that, those really show the world what's going on there. Um, can you give me a sense of, of who joins these forces, like the, this Kareni militia group? And, you know, after the, uh, since the coup of 2021, uh, you know, we can say that, you know, it, this is a countrywide revolution. We're talking about very young people that have left cities, have left their jobs, have left their families, farmers, people from all over walks of life that are basically decided to either travel to ethnic controlled areas to train, pick up a gun, fight, or help in one way or the other the revolution against the military junta uh, to get rid of this dictatorship. Mm. So you were on the show just over a year ago, and, and the last time we talked to you, you had been in the jungle mostly, uh, which is where the conflict was happening at that time. Um, where is the conflict happening now? What's changed? When I went back the last time, which was in November and December last year, for the Globe and Mail, the situation was very different because on October 27 last year, an alliance of northern ethnic militias launched a surprise attack, mm. inflicting heavy losses on the military. This emboldened the Kareni resistance and they launched their own attack to try to take Loiko mm. in November last year. Loiko is the capital of Kareni state, mm -hmm. so the biggest town the administrative town. It's a very, strategically, it's very important. Um, and I arrived inside Loiko, well, let's say about 10 days after the start of the operation because I was invited by some of the top commanders. I received a telephone call. I received a message, sorry, two days after the start of the operation in November saying we've started, we've surrounded the capital and we are aiming to go 100% and wow. take it. If you want to come, you know, we're waiting for you. They knew that I wanted to, that I would have been interested in covering this aspect of the story. This was an historical moment where for the first time in the country, a state capital was about to fall in the hands of the resistant forces fighting the military. Wow. So, so you were there at this battle um, of Loiko. What was that like? Uh, totally different from anything that I witnessed before in the country. You know, we, now we were not talking anymore about uh, countryside fighting, forest fighting or jungle fighting. This was urban warfare, mm -hmm. uh, which is more risky. It's fought building to building, street to street. Uh, sometimes, you know, one building and in front there is another building 100 meters away and you have to control that building. So there was much more mortar shelling, much more bombs from, uh, from fighter jets. The Kareni resistance lost 60 soldiers, which is an incredible increase compared to the 200 soldiers that they lost in the three years of fighting. Um, a totally different scenario uh, to cover, and uh, but on the other hand, very important to be there as a journalist. 
the photos you're taking in Myanmar, I mean, there are these incredible shots of, of active warfare. I mean, there's like shots of this one man who's holding, I guess, a grenade launcher. And you could see like the strain on his face as he's firing. It's, it's just like these incredible shots that you're getting like right in the action. Um, and I'm just wondering, what is it like for you to be in the middle of that? Um, but, you know, the first thing that you try to do in the situations when you're covering conflict is try to be safe uh, and not to get on the way of the people that are taking care of you. Uh, so the group that you're embedded with. Uh, so, you know, you follow and you try to, you know, you, you try to be alert on where uh, people are going, where the soldiers are hiding. Mm -hmm. And you have to hear the sound of the artil artillery being shot. Uh, you have to understand if it's incoming bullets or outgoing, just for you to be as safe as possible. So the best I could do was to actually do my job properly as a journalist, as a photographer. How close are you? Like, because in the pictures, it seems that you're right there. Uh, I was, yeah, I must have been, you know, I think from the guy shooting the RPG, I must have been, you know, three meters, two meters. Wow. I want to get a sense of the, the power and balance between the resistance forces, because there is a power and balance between the resistance forces and um, the military. Can you explain that? You know, the resistance have been fighting. It's, it's a guerrilla warfare that they've been fighting for the last three years. It's hit and run. Um, they haven't been able to hold ground in a conventional way. Their strength, their strategy uh, is based very much on the fact that they are they belong in in the lands that they're fighting for. Uh, the population supports them. Uh, they know the terrain, they know the forest, they know the mountains, they know towns very well. However, on the other hand, the junta has the superiority of firepower. They've got minimal guns, they've got minimal bullets, they've got artillery, they've got fighter jets, they've got trucks, they've got endless supplies of ammunition because they are making this ammunition. But what we are witnessing in the last months, in the last year, is that the resistance is becoming more knowledgeable on how to fight, even in urban scenarios. Mm -hmm. They have more weapons, they have more funding, and they have a boost in morale because they are it looks like on the ground they're winning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and just despite this power imbalance, like you said, there there is this momentum happening. Can you just describe what that means for resistance forces, that they are building this, this momentum? It, uh, from what I can understand, from what I can see in covering Karani State, it means that there is, uh, there is hope. Mm. Hope for a tomorrow free of this military dictatorship. But let us not forget that the the military junta has been in power for 70 years. Uh, it's difficult to imagine a tomorrow without them in power, but if this happens, it's going to be definitely an historic moment. We'll be right back. Okay, let's talk about some of the people you met in Myanmar. Um, like there was this commander that you were stationed with uh, named Ri Du. Can you tell me about him? Uh, yeah, uh, Ri Du is an exceptional person and an exceptional leader in many ways. Um, first of all, uh, his youth is 28 years old. He grew up in the refugee uh, camp on the border regions of Thailand. He was an activist before. Uh, and now uh, he has risen to, you know, one of the highest ranks in the KNDF, the Kareni Nationality Defense Force, and is one of the three top commanders uh, fighting in the, fighting in the conflict. When you arrived, um, how did you meet him? Ridu was waiting for me, but of course, you know, the um, the military, the junta had cut off all uh, telephone and internet service, so I couldn't reach him. I hadn't reached him for one week since I was at the border. Mm -hmm. But I was with a group of soldiers, you know, that they were escorting me from the border area into, in, into the middle of Kareni, towards Loiko. I was told by one of the soldiers that they, they heard a word that Ridu had been injured by um, shrapnel 
Um, when I arrived, it was confirmed because I saw him. Uh, he couldn't walk properly, but he was still standing, you know, giving orders. He was having lunch with his men and talking about the fight. Everyone looked exhausted. They were on the ground. Um, I lost sight of Ridu for about 10 days. Then I met him again. He was better. But even himself, he told me, you know, he was worried because he said, if I don't go and fight, if I'm not in the front line, my soldiers, I fear that my soldiers lack that motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are not conventional soldiers that they're not being paid to fight. They're just there because they believe in the cause. They believe to defeat the military junta. They're there for a reason and they're there because of the leaders that they follow. Um, anyway, thanks God, Ridu was well, uh, I think. And then, you know, within two weeks, he was back in action. Yeah. What ended up happening to uh, Ridu before you left? When Ridu was fit enough to go back and fight, the first day that he went to the front line, unfortunately, his brother uh, lost his life. Mm. His younger brother, he stepped on a landmine. Uh, they tried to drive Rido's young brother to hospital, but they were too far away. So it took five hours to reach hospital. And in these five hours in the car, basically they couldn't stop the the bleeding and he, and he died, he passed. Oh no. Um, how was Rido doing after his brother died? What did he tell you? Basically he said, let's not be sad. This mm -hmm. is the life we choose for ourselves. We fight, and this is the price that we have to pay. But he said, they are, I'm, I'm only very sad because of my mother. He was a youngest child. Wow. Um, I want to ask about the landmines, because this is something we talked about with you last time you were on the show. What's been going on in Myanmar with these landmines? You know, landmines have been put by the military junta in a massive scale around civilian settlements, you know, towns, villages, and even the countryside. Basically, from what I've witnessed, every time the military retreats from an area that they cannot control or they strategically uh, decide to retreat, they put a lot of landmines. In this way, um, the civilians cannot come back. Wow. And this is against international law to use landmines. Uh, yes, yeah. And if civilians cannot come back, then it means that the resistance cannot come back. Because without the civilians, it's a chain reaction. You know, if a village is completely empty of civilians, then there is no one to farm the fields, no one to fend for the animals, no one, you know, to do anything. There is no shops, there is nothing. So the, the resistance cannot live in that village. Did you see any neighborhoods like that, like the, um, that were abandoned because of landmines? Yeah, yeah you, you see them often. You see them on the edge of Loiko. You see them on the edge of the Mosso. Uh, I traveled inside the town of the Mosso and it was, you know, a normal town in Kareni State. When I came back now, basically the vegetation took over everything. The houses have disappeared inside the forest, the jungle. The jungle took over, the forest took over. And I was told, yeah, I was like, yeah, this is areas that we cannot go back because there are just too many landmines. Yeah. Um, so these landmines are impacting the civilians because they can't go back home. Um, but what does a civil war mean more broadly to, to the citizens of the country? This is also a question that we will have to wait and see what mm -hmm. will happen in the future, in the months and the, in the years ahead. So from what I saw, from my expertise in, in what I witnessed, the fight is it's going to be long uh, because even if there is peace, what kind of peace there will be? Uh, we are talking about uh, a country where there, will, there is a lot of guns. We talked about the situation of landmines. There will, the, we will need to see major demining uh, exercises. Uh, so there is a lot of work ahead. And before this, they're still fighting. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe that people are tired. They're mm -hmm. tired of the military dictatorship. They're tired of the war. They're tired of having to leave their homes, not knowing when they come back. From what I can see from from the people that I talk to, this is a sacrifice that 
everyone I talk to is willing to make. Wow. Because they tell, they, they, a lot of people told me if we don't fight now, we will just end up where we were before. <laughs> Slaves of the military elite, the military junta that run the country the way they want for their own benefits only. So the people that are involved inside in the revolution who want a change are totally determined. We just have to wait and see for how long they can be and at what price. Yeah. Siegfried, thank you so much for, for sharing your story and for being on the show. Thank you for talking to me. If you want to see Siegfried's photos, check out the link in our show notes. That's it for today. I'm Cheryl Sutherland. Our producers are Madeline White and Rachel Levy McLaughlin. David Crosby edits the show. Adrian Chung is our senior producer, and Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much for listening. 